Hey, what's good, family? I wanted to drop a word real quick, but before I do, you already know. Let's ask God to be a part of this conversation. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I just pray that this message would be one that is breathed by your spirit, God. I pray that I would be led in the direction you want me to go. And I pray that each person that hears it would be blessed by it. Father, I want to thank you for the gift of prayer. I want to thank you for the gift of communication. And I want to thank you for the gift of your presence, God. I'm reminded in the Bible when you spoke to the prophet Ezekiel, and he, he, you showed him uh, what appeared to be a graveyard, um, just a bunch of dry, dead bones. And you told him to, to speak on them, to breathe on them, to prophesy over them, for life to be brought back to them. And so, Father, as I preach this word, I pray that your life would be saturating this word and that it would touch the hearts and minds of those who hear it. I thank you that your word says, uh, your word is a lamp, but not that one, but uh, your word is alive and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and revealing the innermost desires of our heart. So let your word illuminate what you want to be said. In the name of Jesus the Christ, I pray. I say, Holy Spirit, come on in. You're welcome. Lead me into the truth, because you are the leader in all truth. Amen. All right, y'all. Um, I was just chilling a little bit ago, and what came to my mind was, when God provides a blessing for you, will you recognize it? Another way of saying this, don't miss out on your blessing. Uh, sometimes when God answers a prayer, uh, the presentation that takes place is not what we anticipated, and we can easily overlook a blessing that he's brought in front of us. Um, I love the scripture where it talks about, I think it's in Habakkuk, but it says we walk by faith and not by sight. And sometimes we can underestimate the value of a blessing that God brings in our life because we judge it based on what we see or what we think rather than on what he's telling us. And so my encouragement is to be prayerful when God brings something your way, to recognize is it, if it's of him or if it's a counterfeit. <clears throat> there was a story I heard years ago. Um, I used to watch this show on Family Channel when I was a little boy. It was called Father Dowling Mysteries. It was about a, a priest who would help the police solve murders. Very interesting. And he was in a nightclub one night undercover. And so he had to entertain the crowd. And so he he told a joke and it was a story. It was a, an analogy or a parable. But what he said was there was a man on a roof and the whole city was drowning. And the man was praying to God for God to save him. And he said different people came by to help him. Um, different boats. One guy in a boat said, come on. He said, no, I'm good. I'm waiting on God to save me. Um, and it was it was just gradual. The water kept getting higher and higher. And another boat came, come on. He said, no, I'm all right. I'm waiting on God to save, save me. And then a helicopter said, come on. And he said, I'm all right. I'm waiting on God to save me. And then he drowned. And when he got to heaven, he said, God, why didn't you save me? And God said, I sent two boats and I sent a helicopter. What else did you want? And I just wanted, you know, that what we can glean from that is this guy probably expected God to do something um, that looked the same way as what he read in the Bible. And God is a God that doesn't change and his principles don't change, but the presentation of how he goes about it can look slightly different than what we previously saw in the, in the word. It doesn't conflict with the word. It just shows that we need to discern and be sensitive to how he goes about doing things. I also think about the story of David and Goliath, how Israel was in need of a savior when it came to facing Goliath. And David came on the scene and what the people saw, you know, they just saw a shepherd boy initially. But once he conquered and killed the giant with God's help, they recognized I'll say Saul recognized the future king. Um, sometimes God can do amazing things um, and use people that seem to be unlikely. The word of God says that he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So my reason for saying that is that God's ways are not like ours. The Bible says, as the heavens are to the earth, so are his thoughts to our thoughts. The heavens in altitude are much higher than the earth. That's how his thoughts are to our thoughts. And so we can't always depend on how we view and understand things that we can truly miss out on what God is trying to do in our life. Um, in fact, Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways, acknowledge him and he's going to direct your path. And so this is a position of humility, dependence and um, recognition of a need in your life. And so my encouragement today and when you, I've said a few things, but when you find yourself um, in a situation where perhaps you are wondering, is this an answered prayer? Is this something God has sent my way? One way to discern that is to simply pray and ask God, Father, is this from you? And he'll find, he'll show you. You can even ask him to present, I guess, a test in a sense. Um, so I'm going to read an example from Judges chapter five, chapter six, and you'll see what I'm talking about. 
the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the, so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkey, donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So they're pretty much a bully. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon returned home. He cooked a young goat, and with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel, who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of his staff in his hand, and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought, and the angel of the Lord disappeared." Now, that's a heck of a sign. I forgot about that sign. That wasn't even the sign because it's more that he asked to prove and confirm that God had sent him. Um, one other sign. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Let me just find it. Okay, okay, okay. Here, here it is. This is later on. Then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me, to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. And when I say test, I, I want to be very clear. I said earlier, test God, because there's a scripture that says, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. That's a different context of provoking, disrespecting. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, if you are ever in a situation and you really want to be sure that what God is saying is what he's saying. And you want to be accurate that what's in front of you is an answered prayer. Because sometimes it's very obvious and you don't have to do all this. But sometimes you can say, God, can you confirm this for me? And God will in some way confirm it, just like he did with this. He prayed and God answered. The Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So on some level, God will confirm. What, what does that mean? Sometimes God will use multiple people to say the same thing to confirm that what you are hearing from him or what he's telling you is accurate. And so I want to encourage you today, 
as God brings forth a, pra a prayer in your life, oftentimes he does it through a person, recognize that and be receptive to the prayer because it may not come in the form that you expect, but don't reject it because you can miss out on a blessing that God wants to give you. And then God can confirm, but it's up to you to trust him and go forward. You can't always depend on this. You have to trust him with this. My dad, I told y'all some time ago, he wrote a song years ago called Move by Faith. And one of the, the lyrics go like this. It says, move by faith and not with the thoughts of man so that I can do all that I choose to do for you. If you only knew the things I have in store for you, you would get up and run and you would see it through. Just move by faith and watch me do all that I said I'd do. And it's the same thing in our lives as believers. If we walk by faith and not by sight, imagine what we could experience in our life simply by trusting God. I'll give you another example. Um, well, this is, see, I'm going in a different direction because this isn't about answered prayer, but I guess it is. Um, Abraham, when he went to sacrifice his son Isaac, that's what God told him to do. He was getting ready to do so, but God stopped him and said, there's an angel, there's a ram in the bush. That was the provision waiting for him, but his obedience led him to that point. And so by him trusting God in a difficult situation, God provided in the nick of time and God will do the same for you. The word of God says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And so I want to encourage you today that the enemy wants to attack. I want to tell you the enemy wants to attack your faith. But if you inst if you instead spend time in the presence of God, feed your faith with his word and begin to declare the promises of God in your life, you will start to see change because you are coming into agreement with the word of God. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. What is the stuff that's coming out your mouth? The Bible also says, um, Death and life are in the power of the tongue and we eat the fruit of what we speak or we eat the fruit thereof. So are you in agreement with God or in agreement with your circumstances, in agreement with the world or in agreement with God? And so when God answers your prayer, be mindful that it may come in a form that you didn't anticipate, but don't reject it because you can miss out. For all you know, God might, <clears throat> some of you might have prayed for your significant other, your spouse, your future spouse, and God might have sent them. But because of what they look like, where they were, where they are, you might have rejected them. And I'm not saying you should be with someone that you don't find attractive. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you might have misunderstood what was standing before you and missed out on an amazing blessing because you judged based on the eyes of your flesh rather than what God wanted to show you. And sometimes we make long-term decisions in short-term circumstances and we can truly um, muddle up our lives because we, um, we choose to listen to our logic, our reasoning, which at times is relevant and makes sense. But when it comes to things of the spirit, sometimes when God is showing you something, what he's showing you will defy what makes sense here. And you have to realize our minds are limited. His mind is vast. And so we can't see the full scope of everything. And so you have to understand you have a choice. Will you depend on what you think or see things through his lens? And seeing through the, seeing things through his lens is like faith. It's like an aerial, aerial viewpoint in a helicopter. You're above the ground, so you see a spatial scope of everything. Whereas if you're down here and you see it this way, you're seeing things, but you're not fully taking it all in. In fact, the Bible says eternity has been planted in the human heart, but we cannot see the full scope of it. So God knows what he's doing, and I want to encourage you to trust him and just give your concerns and worries to him and watch him change your life. Now, before I close, I want to invite you to get in a relationship with Jesus. The only way to get to the Father is through the Son. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, unfortunately, you're going to spend an eternity in hell and in the lake of fire. That's a place of judgment, and God doesn't want us to go there. That's meant for Satan and those demons. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. So he's provided a gift of eternal life, which means putting your faith in Jesus. But you have a choice. He doesn't force... Oh, that's annoying. I'm getting sick of that. My computer. He doesn't force his will upon you. But you have a choice to decide whether you want to know him or not. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, as a Christian, you're going to be, you're going to be criticized. You're going to be um, attacked, sometimes persecuted, and sometimes people trying to take your life. That comes with the territory. But blessed are you when these happen, because it says those who endure to the end shall be saved. And if these things are happening to you for his sake, then you're blessed. So if you want to know Jesus, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe God the Father raised you back from the dead. Please come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. If you did that, you're born again. The Spirit of God is in you. Your name is in the book of life. I recommend you get in a Bible-based church. Watch God transform your life. And if you want some good reading, I just finished publishing my new book on Amazon. 
It's called Random Thoughts of a Believer. My name is Daryl Alder II. I'm on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. This is about to cut out. Gotta go. Peace.